Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and this is always one of my favorite parts of the meeting, is talking to um, the, you guys about what we do and why we do it. So that's how I'm going to frame this talk today. Now, I think to understand uh, breast cancer treatments and where we are today, I think we need to say a few words about where we have been. I think we all understand that things are getting better. Breast cancer mortality has been decreasing since the 1990s. Um, and I'm a bit, little bit embarrassed to say this standing on a stage with a surgeon, but I think the surgeons will recognize the fact that improved surgical techniques have improved quality of life, but really have not improved quantity of life. And I think that's an important thing to recognize. Uh, and we also understand that improvements ha in outcomes have been due to population-wide screening mammograms uh, and improved medical therapies for breast cancer. So I'm going to speak mostly about improved medical therapies for breast cancer. I do want to comment that most of our new therapies have been evaluated first in women with advanced breast cancer, and that's been a big plus. Uh, and I'll try to explain to you why I think it's a little bit difficult to continue with that current model in trying to improve the overall outcomes for all women with breast cancer. So just a word about why I said that, um, that improvements are due to population-wide screening mammography and improved medical therapies. This comes from a uh, model that uh, Don Barry, a biostatistician, put together several years ago, uh, and it demonstrated in his model what would have happened to breast cancer uh, mortality if we didn't do any screening or adjuvant therapy, if we did screening only, if we did adjuvant therapy uh, with just medical therapy after surgery, or both uh, together, and the both together currently models trends. Uh, I think you know the next big session, the plenary session today, will be harms done by screening mammography. So I think it'll be a very interesting topic because it's completely relevant to this particular curve. I think that anytime we do a screening procedure, there's always risks, as there's always risks for any therapy we do. But just to comment, I'm gonna spend most of the time now on how we've improved the medical therapy for breast cancer. So I want to start with kind of how I was raised in terms of treating breast cancer. So a woman has surgery, we then understand the fact that we need to treat micrometastatic disease and we give chemotherapy. So this is a trial that was published by Dr. Henderson now 10 years ago that established the use, oops, I'm sorry, of paclitaxel in uh, treatment of breast cancer. So this was a very simple trial. Women after their surgery were assigned to receive adriamycin and cytoxan, or adriamycin and cytoxan and plus surgery. So that demonstrates the difference. And now, as you know, paclitaxel, AC paclitaxel is in many uh, areas the standard of care. But I think there's some obvious things about this graph that um, concern should concern all of us. First one is the number of women uh, it took to volunteer for this trial to have this result. Uh, so almost uh, over 3,000 women were enrolled in this trial to demonstrate the difference. The second thing is that how long it took to have this report. Um, in some ways, how long it took to have this report come out is a good thing because obviously most women do well with uh, surgical management of breast cancer. But on the other hand, to demonstrate the difference, it takes a long time. And the difference is not as substantial as anybody would have liked. So even though paclitaxel added to the chemotherapy has improved over uh, no paclitaxel, there are still two problems with that. One, a substantial number of women are still uh, recurring, even though they get the standard, the best, uh, the new uh, therapy, a new agent, um, and that number is um, still a relatively small difference between the two curves. So. Again, when I started training, this is how we did adjuvant therapy. Everybody was given the same thing, and I'd like just leave you with the idea that that's probably not going to work. And the reason we know it's not going to work, I know you've all seen versions of this slide um, in some form or another, but this is one of the original ones from Dr. Peru uh, that demonstrates gene expression profiling across a number of breast cancers. In case you haven't seen this slide before, every tumor this direction, uh, every line this direction is a tumor, Every line this direction is a gene. So if you take all the breast cancers and do gene expression profiling and measure even just a handful of genes, you see they're not all the same. If you could blow this up to really minute levels, you'd see none of the two, two breast cancers are exactly like another. But furthermore, there are major differences in groups. So you know, there's red over here, green over there, red over there, green over there. And they do lump into at least six, seven, ten subtypes. So if you think about it, how in the world could a single therapy benefit every single subtype? 
And that's really where our challenge is today. I think if you take anything from the rest of the meeting, that's going to be how many of the talks are dis discussed, is really what are the important key molecular phenotypes and clinical phenotypes of breast cancer, and then how do we address those risks? So it's gotten more complicated since Dr. Peru outlined this particular scenario. This from, is from a relatively recent paper that further refined um, the uh, risk analysis. So this was a combination of gene expression profiling and gene copy number, but as you see the graph now, you separate this into many, many different subtypes. Some subtypes do reasonably well, some subtypes don't do so well and have an early risk of recurrence. It's extremely important, I think, to begin to recognize this heterogeneity. If you ask any clinician who has been practicing any length of time, they'll say, we have always recognized this heterogeneity. I think our challenge is how do we do something about it and how do we act on that. I wanted to start as a piece of history, uh, the first example of how we acted on this and use this as a paradigm. This is a very heavy HER2 morning. You're going to see some results from neoadjuvant trials uh, and I wanted to set this up just to, as a way to think about it. Uh, for those of you that haven't been to San Antonio before, the reason we're here is because of the late Bill McGuire. Dr. McGuire was my boss when I worked here and hired me. Um, uh, and Dr. McGuire's contribution, I think, to breast cancer was one, putting this meeting together. I honestly don't think we would have been here if Bill didn't really push the idea that we needed to have a meeting that established uh, and was a forum for translational science in breast cancer. That was his focus. And this particular paper was a collaboration between him and Dennis Slayman in the uh, 1987 uh, in science demonstrating that the HER2 new oncogene had something to do with breast cancer. The results of the paper shown here was a very simple paper. Dr. McGuire had a uh, collection of frozen tumors that he knew the follow-up on. Dr. Slayman came to Dr. McGuire and said, you know, can we measure HER2 gene amplification in your um, data set? And that's what it showed. So if we look at disease-free survival or overall survival, it was discovered that more than five copies of the genes uh, identified were associated with poorer risk, both in terms of disease-free survival and overall survival. So when I showed you before the clusters of breast cancers that do not so well, it's important to recognize what drives those clusters. HER2 was one of the first examples, and I think we all understand now that HER2 is a very complicated set of interactions and molecules. But the good news about HER2, and a very important part about the example of HER2, so this is a gene amplified in breast cancer. It's overexpressed as we developed a variety of different molecules that will attack that particular uh, receptor. HER2 is a transmembrane uh, molecule that is kind of a growth factor receptor. And what I mean by kind of a growth factor receptor, I'll explain it to you in a minute. Um, it sticks on the outside and spans the membrane, and then the inside has a, a, a domain called the tyrosine kinase domain. The tyrosine kinase domain's function in life is to take the terminal phosphate off of ATP and then stick it on itself. So that's what it does. Once this receptor is activated, it catalyzes an enzymatic activity. That enzymatic activity is transfer phosphate to itself. Once it transfers phosphate to itself, it then uh, signals to lots of downstream signaling pathways. My analogy is always this is a little bit like a blank Lego. So if you had a blank Lego with no little nubs on it, it really couldn't bind anything. But the phosphorylation event, the very first ph phosphorylation is putting nubs on the molecule so other things can bind to it and trigger a trans single to transduction pathway. So given that, we developed a variety of different drugs. The first one was trastuzumab. The second one was pertuzumab, and we'll say a few more words about pertuzumab. The third one was TDM1. Those are all monoclonal antibodies in one form or another that bind the molecule HER2. We also know that there are a series of chemicals that inhibit the enzymatic activity of the HER2 molecule. Um, lapatinib, neurantinib, afatinib. Lapatinib is uh, the one that's approved for treatment in breast cancer. And we believe the signaling pathways all lead to cell growth differentiation and cell survival. Now, the fact that it's called HER2 means there is a HER1 through HER3 through HER4, and the various combinations, how these molecules interact, likely dictate the outcome. Uh, I want to spend a word a little bit about why that was important to understand. And this is a paper from uh, uh, Dr. Hanahan and Weinberg that identified the hallmarks of cancer. So if you just sit down on a piece of paper and ask the question, how do you how does a cancer cell differ from a normal cell? You can identify certain hallmarks. 
Uh, I'm not going to belabor all of these in detail. I will point out a couple. Uh, the one that's relevant, oh, I'm sorry, the one that's relevant to her too is likely the self-sufficiency and growth signals. So when the gene is amplified, you then get the ability to continue signaling through a pathway that's normally regulated in growth and development. But if you go around the circle, you identify all of these particular molecules have a role, uh, uh, have a developed therapy. So angiogenesis has been targeted, limitless replicated potential. That's a very, to me, shorthand for saying they make a lot of DNA. And that's been the standard of our care is uh, targeting DNA synthesis. Invasion and metastasis and evading cell death are all important phenotypes that can be targeted. There's also some emerging hallmarks, and I want to comment, if you wander the poster session and you think about the hallmarks, you'll find uh, molecules that target all of these. I want to point out one very important part because it's going to come up in our uh, plenary discussions today is tumor-promoting inflammation. I think it's very clear now that breast cancer and its microenvironment, particularly the immune effector cells, interact in a very important way. And I think as I looked at the abstract this morning, some of the important findings will come from tumor-promoting inflammation. So what are the new strategies that we should be talking about? We could block the key signaling pathways, and you'll see a lot of data on the PI3 kinase signaling pathways. We could block growth factor receptors. We've heard a little bit yesterday in some educational uh, uh, sessions about blocking ADP repair uh, with the PARP inhibitors. I think our field, and I'm talking about our field of breast cancer, is a little bit behind on the immunotherapy aspects of the disease. For those of you looking at the news, um, our colleagues, our hematology colleagues at the American Society of Hematology have made tremendous strides in treating certain diseases like B cell neoplasms with engineering of T cells, and I think we should do that for breast cancer as well. Honestly, I think it will be harder to do this in breast cancer than it will be in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, where there's a very defined antigen that you can target and attack and not damage tumor's host tissue. But even when you do that, the toxicities of the immune therapies are incredible, at least these chimeric antigen receptor T cells, the CARs that have made it in the paper and, and on the national news for the past couple of days. Um, targeting host functions like blood vessels, you know, bevacizumab was controversial, uh, but that's what it does, and we want to improve our existing therapies. So I think that's in a very, oh, I'm sorry, that's a very important part of what we're doing, is trying to improve on what we built, uh, and I'll try to explain how that's being addressed in several trials. So what are our challenges now? Breast cancer research has revealed many potential targets. Many of the new drugs have been targeted to specific molecules and that one size very clearly does not fit all. All the multiple subtypes of breast cancer exist. Not all tumors express the target, and even if you express the target, not all tumors will respond to inhibition of the target. Pathway to delivering the most appropriate therapy that matches tumor vulnerability is not clear. I will give you an example today, and this morning you're gonna hear many examples of the same thought about neoadjuvant strategies to try to improve outcome. So, um, Let's turn to that. One question is, should clinical trials change to exploit progress? So when I uh, explained the AZ taxol study to you, um, there was no real clear way that we could identify how taxol would benefit a subgroup of patients that, that, and wouldn't, so we included everybody. But now that we know that different therapies exist for different subtypes, maybe we should give the chemotherapy before surgery, and that's the neoadjuvant platform. So if we understand that a woman would benefit from systemic therapy, um, giving chemotherapy beforehand could potentially identify effective therapies, and I need to comment that giving neoadjuvant therapy isn't any better or worse than giving therapy after surgery. I'm talking about neoadjuvant therapy now strictly as a way to think about progress in developing new drugs. So it allows for the collection of specimens uh, to evaluate sp those specific, uh, to evaluate efficacy for specific therapies. It could allow assignment to the best therapy and complete disappearance of tumor, what we call pathologic complete response of a tumor. And surgery is a good surrogate for better overall survival. Why neoadjuvant therapy is important comes from a guidance uh, list uh, outlined by the Food and Drug Administration about a year and a half ago. The Food and Drug Administration doctors Prowl and Pazdar offered the opinion that since we understand the complete disappearance of the tumor prior to surgery from a systemic therapy, in other words, pathologic complete response after neoadjuvant therapy was associated with favorable outcomes, 
the FDA could see a way to approve drugs in that setting. So that statement actually was very important for the breast cancer community because um, the way we've done it in the past is that we waited until the drugs demonstrated some efficacy and safety in, in the advanced breast cancer, which is important, and I think a very important thing to know that that will continue. But then it took a variety of different steps to move that particular drug forward in the adjuvant setting. So just think about it for a second. If you are a company that developed a drug that in, in is effective in 4% of all breast cancers, um, and you prove that, and you had to do a 3,000 woman trial in the usual adjuvant setting to prove its benefit, you just would never do it. Because it would take way too long, the screening would be very difficult, and I hate to be uh, cynical about companies, but towards the end of the trial, your patent life would be over. So there's no major incentive to do the actual surgical regular adjuvant therapy, but the neoadjuvant platform allows you a way to get some indication of the activity of a drug much sooner. So we'll come back to HER2 because this was the first test. As I mentioned to you, HER2 is a molecule that binds, sticks out the, uh, the membrane and crosses the membrane and has a tyrosine kinase domain. The drug trastuzumab has been approved for a long time and has changed the face of breast cancer, I think, in terms of how do we think about it and the outcome for women with HER2 positive diseases. Uh, at the same time, the drug pertuzumab was developed that binds a different portion of the HER2 molecule. So one thing pertuzumab does is keep it from interacting with its partners, HER1, 3, or 4, and that's a very different property than trastuzumab. So the trial that was testing uh, the ability of pertuzumab in the neoadjuvant setting was called Neosphere. So Neosphere enrolled 400 women, and I think it's important to note the number 400, HER2 positive breast cancer patients, so we already know HER2 was a marker, um, and they had operable tumors more than two centimeters. So as a medical oncologist, this is a subset of women that we would recommend adjuvant therapy that would be Herceptin-based or Trastuzumab-based. So there's no question if the woman opted not to be on the study in that surgery, we would recommend a, a trastuzumab-based therapy. So in the neoadjuvant setting, women could be assigned to the, the uh, taxane docetaxel or taxotere plus trastuzumab, docetaxel plus the two antibodies, the two antibodies all by themselves, or docetaxel plus uh, pertuzumab, leaving out the trastuzumab. The results of the trial were shown here. Um, first off, I want to point out a couple of things. The numbers are fairly small. There are 100 patients roughly in each arm. Compare that to the 1,500 patients that were enrolled on the Taxol study. The second thing to point out is that there was substantial benefit for pertuzumab plus trastuzumab plus docetaxel in achieving pathologic complete response rate. The pathologic complete response rate in those subset of women uh, that got the standard of care was about 22% as opposed to 40%. And even better, if you look at the subgroup of women, the study was not designed to test this, but this is a subset analysis of 30% for those women that were estrogen and progesterone and receptor negative but HER2 positive, uh, and then 54% in those women that had both um, antibodies. So in September, this went before the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee, or ODAC, for recommendation. The question that was being asked was can this product be used in combination with trastuzumab and docetaxel for the neoadjuvant treatment of patients with uh, HER2 positive breast cancer? I think you already know that pertuzumab is approved in the advanced setting. You may already know that there is a regular adjuvant trial using pertuzumab in postoperative setting, but this was a different question to the FDA is that can we get approval now for women with HER2, big HER2 positive tumors to use this drug? And the answer was they did approve that drug. It's a conditional approval. Um, the FDA was very clear about how they will regulate the progress of these trials. But nonetheless, it was, to me, it was an important ideologic advance of how you bring a new drug forward. Um, I want to end a little bit with a trial that I've been involved with, uh, and Jane Perlmutter in the room also has been involved with the iSPY2 trial to really build on the neoadjuvant platform. The idea here is that women with, again, with large tumors who you would recommend chemotherapy will get uh, screened. They'll get research MRIs and biopsies. They will then be assigned to the standard of care, which is weekly Paxil, or standard of care plus another agent. 
another biopsy three weeks into the trial in an MRI, another MRI, and another MRI. So the principle behind this trial is that we want to bring investigational agents forward in the early stage treatment of breast cancer, and we want to be able to test them in subsets where we uh, uh, obtain all the appropriate biomarker studies. So I'm a sub a co chair of the agent selection committee. These are the drugs that are moving through. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all the drugs, except to say the first results we presented Friday of our, the PARP inhibitor Velaparib. Uh, Hope Rugo will be presenting this from the platform Friday morning. It's Velaparib Carbo plus standard neoadjuvant therapy uh, from iSpy2. So uh, if you're interested in this topic, I would urge you to see that talk. Um, I want to talk about one thing I've been interested in for a long time, so I'm going to indulge me for just two or three minutes about a pathway I've been interested in, and is a drug in the trial. So this is a drug, genitimab. It's an inhibitor of the IGF receptor uh, receptor. The IGF receptor is important to normal growth and development. There have been many drugs that have come and already failed in this field. Uh, we have included in the ISPY2 trial because we haven't really tested it in this setting with chemotherapy. So just a second about uh, how I got interested in IGF-1 as a target. You know, this was a paper that I published when I was a fellow a long time ago showing that IGF-1 had a role in human breast cancer and that this particular drug blocks that pathway. I use this cartoon to explain to you what IGF-1 does. Um, every organism, flies, worms, dogs, fish, birds, have an IGF-1-like gene and they, it causes normal growth. So this particular paper from Dr. Ostrander demonstrated that a polymorphism in the IGF-1 gene is the only gene or the single most important gene in, in determining dog size. So uh, the, uh, uh, this must be like a mini chihuahua or this is smaller than a regular chihuahua, has a gene polymorphism different than the um, uh, Great Dane. And that's the graph shown here. The body size correlates very well with the frequency of a normal IGF-1 gene. So IGF-1 genes are important for normal growth and development, and therefore they should be important for growth and development of a tumor. And that's really been where my research area has been. So I just want to show you an anecdotal story. This is a patient I took care of earlier this year. Um, she uh, was one of the young women who noticed a breast cancer while she was weaning her from her child. It turned out to be a fairly big tumor, two and a half centimeters. Her biopsy showed it was a high-grade tumor. It was ER weekly positive, PR negative, and HER2 negative. I think every medical oncologist in the world would have suggested this woman should receive adjuvant therapy. She was willing to participate in ISPY2 and got assigned to the drug genitimab. So this was her MRI prior to treatment of, uh, now just about a year ago with a fairly large tumor. Um, at three weeks, her tumor was already getting smaller as detected by MRI, and then at surgery or at the end of 12 weeks of therapy, it was no longer detectable by MRI. She went to surgery um, on, in June. She had no residual tumor in her breast or sentinel axillary node, and she had a focal scar in her previous tumor site. This was her biopsy or her MRI after her AC. So I just put that out as an anecdote because it's very satisfying to me to have something I've been working on forever actually benefit a patient I took care of. I'm not going to pretend to tell you that genitimab is going to do this for everyone who gets it, but it tells you, I think, a way that we can try to test the hypothesis in a, in a way that is much faster. So you will notice the elapsed time there seemed like a long time, six months. But in the comparison of results from a regular adjuvant trial that may take six or seven years, we get to an answer much faster and with a fewer number of women enrolled on the trial. So um, I think new knowledge requires new trials. Cancer research revealed multiple new pathways. Most of the therapies will benefit a minority of patients with breast cancer. So again, I want to make sure I understand, emphasize that point. Some drugs may be completely effective in 2 to 5% of all breast cancer patients. And we need to understand uh, how to include those women on trials and gain that knowledge. I think business as usual, meaning we wait for the drug to be completely developed in the adjuvant setting, or excuse me, in the advanced setting and apply that to standard adjuvant will impede progress. I know there's a level of controversy about the neoadjuvant platform and testing experimental therapeutics. I'd be happy to talk about that in the discussion section. And finally, I would argue that industry regulatory agents and patients uh, have to advocate for change for the way we're doing things as usual. So I'll then end there and yield the platform to Dr. Newman. I think we're going to.